compared to 200 years ago when it comes to seeds and soil and farming and our guts, um, it seems like a lot of the stuff we were doing 200 years ago was probably way, way more logical than it is today, but we have a lot more people. So at this point, knowing everything you know and knowing how much gentler we were on the planet 200 years ago, but knowing that we have a big population now, if you were fully in charge of all the countries, including the United States, and you, your decisions were final, when it comes to seeds and farming and our gut health, what are the specific policies that you would put in place to resolve and move us forward in a positive way? Uh, God, I get to play God. That's cool. Okay. Goddess. Can I love you? <laughs> Bring me your needs. I'll take care of them. Um, so in my talk, I talked about this study that was done that is really, really impressive because the answer has been validated by science. It's called the, Interna it's called the International Assessment of Agriculture Science. And I'll give you the AA. It's called I. If you want to look it up, it's IAASTD, the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development. Okay. And what this happened was like 400 highly regarded experts, they did peer review studies, they, they, the top quality science all over the world, 110 countries. And when they came out with the result, 58 countries validated, signed on, said this is the way to go. And basically, this one word that you need to remember is called agroecology. Okay, I love it that David's nodding. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and if you don't know what it is, I highly um, encourage you to find out about what agroecology is because if we're talking about systems. We're talking about taking this linear thinking that created the industrial system, created genetic engineering. You know, what are engineers? They want to go from A to B, right? Okay, what is life? Life is cyclical, it's diverse, it's crazy, it does all kinds of things we don't understand. So that's, you know, a system. Right? And we, it's chaotic and we don't understand it and, and we have this need to understand it. I mean, we've been talking about knowledge. I, I really would like to give a pitch for humility, you know. I think that if we could approach these problems with this real grounded sense that we don't know. Here's what we do know, here's what we understand, here's what we'd like to have happen. Let's try it out carefully. In Europe, they... Um, um, they're, they're more likely to use what they call the precautionary principle, which is a preventative way of saying, look, if, you, if, if we really don't think it's safe, we probably shouldn't do it. So there are, there are so many good ideas and really validated models for both law and knowledge and practices that, that you, we can bring into this discussion to say, how do we change the system that we, we know is not working, that's really hurting ourselves and hurting the planet? Um, and in, in, in terms of agriculture just alone, the IAASTD talks about local production, but the, the, you're always dealing with scale. You're always dealing with scale. You have to, you can, get, you can get new models of production that fit in one area. You have to understand, you know, how can we scale that up, make it a little bit more economically productive for the regional farmers, things like that. So these are questions that have to be solved. If, um, in my book I talked about, when they talked about um, the creation of genetically engineered seeds, if they'd spent a fraction of the money that they've spent on genetic technologies and chemicals alone and put it into ecological answers, we would have these answers at hand, they'd be the practices. But unfortunately, because of the political situation, we've diverted our, our, our best interests and our, and our um, resources towards technological answers. So I say, I said in my talk, I'm going to give you an easy way to think about it. If you want to evaluate where we're headed, we have this biological model. Like I said, nature finds the answers. We can work with our nature, our better nature, and, they, and the natural world to find the answers that we need. Or we can go biotechnology and have this very limited engineered, very limited linear view of how to come up with solutions that, re, that basically are private, patented, commercial solutions and very limited, you know, there's, they're, they're for a li very limited uses. I, you know, I oppose them, but I can understand why people think that it might, it might have been a good idea. But it's a very small view of the world. So we can broaden our view of the world, broaden our view of what's possible, open up our minds to other ways of knowing, other ways of doing things, 
and come up with better solutions and, and use these other models that are out there. The reason you, and I speak as now as a journalist, the reason you have not heard of them is because journalism is not doing its job of informing people. And uh, that's another topic. <laughs> yes. yes. And it's not limited to this topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a problem. Yes. Um, I guess the, the first thing that I want to do in, in responding to following up to that and to responding to the question is to point out that 200 years ago it was farming practices that really drove the American colonists west over the Appalachians. Why? Well, they exhausted the soils of the eastern seaboard. So the idea is not simply to go back to some idyllic way that agriculture was in the past because we've used those techniques in the past and they have not proven sustainable. Now there's other examples in some places where there's fields that have been farmed for thousands of years using sustainable approaches. Those weren't the ones that made it to the American colonies, um, but that's sort of a longer thing I go through in the book uh, uh, as well. It's a beautiful part of your book actually. Oh, thank really you. Well done. Um, but so I think if we look towards the future, and if you're asking me to put sort of the hat on of what policies would I recommend, the idea of agroecology, I was nodding my head because I actually agree, that is very much the way forward. Yeah. Uh, thinking about how to actually implement that and how to do it in different settings for different crops in different parts of the world with different kinds of soils is going to take a major research effort. And I completely agree with the idea in terms of we've made some society, societal level the amount of resources we've invested into proprietary technologies for agriculture greatly swamps the ones where I think we really need to make the public investments okay. in terms of how to operationalize agroecological principles and techniques for both small farms and I actually think very large farms because I think it's feasible to do so. Um, and how would you do that? Um, I, there's a lot of different ways to argue about how to go forward on that, but there's uh, some methods that are referred to loosely as conservation agriculture that I think provide a way to go forward, particularly in thinking about some of the larger um, farms that still need some research uh, needs. But the combination of three elements of don't disturb the soil surface, um, either going for no-till or low-disturbance agriculture, um, growing cover crops so the ground is not bare and vulnerable to erosion and so you can actually get legumes to bring uh, nitrogen back into the soil um, and to scavenge other nutrients and um, and also diversifying crop rotations. One of the big problems that have led to the overuse of both herbicides and pesticides are the habit of like planting corn, soy, corn, soy in a regular predictable sequence on the same piece of ground over and over again and guess what? The pests and pathogens adapt. Um, and fairly rapidly. Uh, I was just out visiting some farmers in South Dakota a few uh, weeks ago who've gone to some very large acreages, not to completely organic, but to very, very low chemical input um, by basically following those techniques, going to no-till, going to cover crops, and diversifying the rotations so it's not a predictable rotation and they get sort of a diversity of crops. On The thing that I was very amazed by is that they've literally sort of shut off the erosion problem but they've also improved their own bottom line. They're making more money doing it. They're spending less on the inputs and they're getting just as much output. And there's this transition period, but they've sort of gone through it and they're really happy with it. And they're doing better than their neighbors. And I think therein lies a, you know, a cause for, an arguable cause for optimism, is that if we can get the kind of methods developed and to farmers so that they can see the benefit, not just to their own land, but also to the bottom line on their farm, you get those two things to line up, they love doing the right thing by their land. They know their land. They pay attention to it. They've seen a lot of the changes to it. They really, many of them, most of the ones I've talked to, and again, I may be talking to a biased subset, but they really care about their land. But they also have to stay in business as farmers. Um, getting those two things to line up is, I think, a major societal challenge that if you're asking me to redirect policy, a huge research effort aimed at generating non-proprietary techniques uh, for pushing the bounds of the application of agroecology forward to be, be very high on my list. Um, a number of the farmers I've also talked to have basically said that one of the best things that can be done to agricultural policy is just eliminate all the subsidies. Because then farming techniques that actually take care of the land would prosper over the long run. And these are the farmers that are giving me that idea. But, but. Well, I, we, Let's reform the subsidies, shall we? we? We eliminate a lot of them, especially the production. But let's let's help. Let's continue to subsidize public 
public plant breeding, public yeah. uh, research programs. Public, I would argue we should be uh, subsidizing things that are in the long term healthy. public interest. There you go. And that's not what we've been doing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So let's reform them and maybe we could cut them way, way, way down. I agree. <laughs> yes. I think we underestimate our own power and the role that we play. When we started teaching uh, therapeutic lifestyle change in Rockford, uh, and we were going to drink almond milk instead of uh, cow's milk, we all knew which store had almond milk, right? Now we go to any grocery store and there's six or seven kinds of almond milk, but only one of them, Pacifica, is organic. It's organic. And so, so we got them to go from one to six or seven. Now we'll start getting them to go to, oh, one of those being organic to more of them being organic. So we have the power of the purse, and we now have the power of things going viral. Uh, we, we can create an infectious spread of lifestyle medicine, um, and uh, the marketplace will respond. And so don't, don't underestimate our power, along with policy, and along with joining organizations that call us and then offer to connect us. Uh, it's very hopeful. Just a th one thought about 200 years ago, Stephen, um, because I was thinking about, I can't remember exactly when Rudolf Steiner started uh, looking at, uh, pardon? Early 1900s. Early 1900s. Sort of one of the, if you look at the beginnings of organic, the or what we know now as the organic farming movement, it started with the idea of what are these chemicals that we're starting to do. At that time, it was mostly fertilizers and, and herbicides, but um, it's, of course, expanded into the tremendous array of, of toxic chemicals we're now using in agriculture. But the, back at the time, they was looking at what they were finding. And so the first beginning of that was the nutritional profile of the foods that were being produced that way had been seriously degraded. And um, we've, we have a lot of information about different farming practices and how that does. But I think 200 years ago, I'd, I'd like to know what the cancer rate was then, because um, I, I totally agree with you about the farming practices and that wasn't as good. But in some ways, that, ha that I, I'm certain that the food that was being produced at that time was probably far more nutritious uh, than it is now. 